Did you catch that? Well, in case you missed it, that's how you hand forge a knife. And in this Your Edge video, we're going to go back to all the basics, not skipping anything, and explain why and how you do what and when. All right, let's cut the fast edit. On this next one, we'll show you every single bit of it without editing. The first thing I do is cut off the tip of any knife or sword blade or anything like that. The reason why I do that is to ensure that all the grain follows the edge completely. In a later video, I will explain exactly what's going on in the steel and why you should always do that. The second thing I do is I set up this plunge right here. First asymmetrically with one or two hits of the hammer and then flip the blade over and just move the asymmetrical plunge completely centered. Before we go any further, I'm going to have a seat and tell you about today's sponsor that made this video possible. And that sponsor is Mech Arena. No, not the Mach Arena. No, Mech Arena is a mech first person shooter built for friendly PvP action. One of the greatest features of this awesome first person shooter is its quick play style. You can play start to finish a game in about five minutes. And with this game's smaller, tighter map layouts, there's no looking around for the enemy. There's action-packed sequences that happen right away. To clarify, this is not a reflex first-person shooter, but it doesn't have that slow-paced mech game that you're used to. This is fast and action-packed. And this month, we have the Easter Golden Week, where you can get even more skins and weapons for the game. Mech Arena is completely free to play on both the iOS and the Android. And you can use my personal link or scan the QR code to get one Steel Reaper skin, 500 Acorns, and 70,000 credits to help kickstart your game, which is a $45 value. And if you're quick enough, you can add me as a friend in the game and we can get to playing some matches together. So don't wait around, click the link, use the QR code and download Mech Arena and play with me today. So now, let's get back to forging a knife. Some of you might notice that the preform for a Bowie knife is the exact same shape as a clip point sax, and that is not a surprise. After that, I proceed to bevel the entire knife. The next thing I can do is I use a hot cut to isolate the material which will later on become the tank. I usually go to the power hammer to actually stretch out the tank but that's completely not necessary and you can do it by hand. The power hammer just makes it faster. After the tang is formed, I use either the corner of the anvil or my nice hardy tool to set up uh, this part of the knife, which in sword making is called ricasso, and I'm not a knife maker, so I'm gonna call it the ricasso.
After throwing up the ricasso, you will notice that the plunge swells up and clears a bit more. After that, you go and basically planish on the surface of the flat of your knife, not touching the bevel. At this point, all you're doing is fixing up a little bit of a shape, a little bit of a wobble, and prepare your knife for profile grinding, which shouldn't take much, because the whole point of this exercise that I'm teaching right now is to have a knife blank at the end of your forging that you can fix with a file and get ready for heat treating without even getting to any power abrasives or a grinder. In order to explain the exact process of what you're seeing, I'm going to use the blackboard. Let's go back to school. Here is my bar, the way you see it laying on the end. Starts out like this. This is the edge of the end. What you're going to do is to use the edge of the anvil to establish a plunge line on the other side. That way, this bulges out somewhat like this. From the side, the bar will look like this. Here's the full thickness of the bar, here's the plunge, and that's our spine. This looks ugly and crooked every which way at first. So in the same heat, what we're doing, we're flipping our bar, so now the edge of the anvil this is our bar. We see a clear plunge line. Like this, like this. And this is the plunge line. It looks ugly at first. We're angling it to the edge of the anvil and tapping it. What you're using is you're hitting the hammer into this area. Part of the ricasso, a little bit over the plunge. Same thing here. The key is to not only hit here, but also get with the flat of the hammer this area effectively pushing it down so as you're pushing it down this stretches out this way if you're just hitting here you're going to get an ugly plunge line so make sure this is where your hammer position should be and once again gently tapping so if at this stage we are also setting up our bevel at this stage, we're not touching the bevel whatsoever. What we're doing is kicking it back to the center. And after you establish all that, then you go to the tip and forge your bevel to this plunge line. You might not want to do any beveling somewhere right here so you don't mess up this area. And if you do that, you can clean up your knife before heat treating with a file and be perfectly fine. However, this technique only works if you use proper hammer technique and no other. You want more school? Let's do this. All right. Everybody, pull up your chairs. This is going to be the section called I'm not a blacksmith unless I know this. So what do we have? When I forge, the distance between the hammer and the anvil is approximately one meter, give or take. So distance delta x equals one meter. The weight of the hammer is about three kilograms. M equals 3 kg. Acceleration, assuming I'm not imparting any extra energy downward, is 9.8 meters per second squared. Acceleration equals 9.8 meters per second squared. When we're dealing with impact, we need to think in terms of momentum and kinetic energy. So let's first calculate the amount of kinetic energy that is imparted into your piece. Well, 
kinetic energy equals k e equals one half m v squared right out of this we have mass and we have nothing else now fortunately enough that's the brilliance of physics everything is balanced kinetic energy is equals to potential energy and potential energy equals force times delta x our distance so that equals Acceleration times mass times this. Boop, boop, boop. So we have one, one meter, times three, that is our mass, three kilograms, times 9.8 meters per second squared. This is kg and this is meters. That equals approximately 29 joules. However, let's not get bogged down in this. Instead, what we're going to do, let's clear this out, 1 half m v squared equals m times delta x times uh, acceleration, right? This is the beauty of uh, Newtonian physics once again because it doesn't matter for the calculation of the final velocity what mass of the hammer you have yet. So we can immediately cross out the m on both sides of the equation. And for ease, let's multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of this one half because it's ugly. So, as a result, we have v squared equals 2 times x times acceleration, which is the force of gravity. Now, that gives us v equals square root of 2x times a. v equals, let's say, 2 times 1 is 2, and a is 9.8, so 2 times 9.8 is 19.6, uh, square root of 19.6, with whatever respective units there are. And the respective units will be uh, meter square over uh, second square. So let's pull out our trusty training wheels. And on 6. It's four point V equals velocity equals four point four meters per second. Four point four meters per second. This is important, right? That is with a standard hit. So now we're ready to calculate the rest of the stuff. Let's write it down somewhere else, memorize it. So we're going back to momentum. Momentum is P, and momentum is equal to mv. And that is equal 4.4 times 3. So 4.4 times 3 is... Uh, two, one here, three, one, uh, boo, boo, boo. kilograms meter per second. So that's our momentum. That is the energy received by the piece when you hit it with a hammer at 90 degrees down. Right? That is the amount of momentum. Now, let's erase all this. We already have everything we need. This is the surface of the anvil. This is the vertical axis. The hammer hits down this way. So all the momentum is completely absorbed by your piece. 
this angle is 90 degrees. When we calculate how much energy is along this, conceptually, we use sine of this angle. So because we know that sine of equals 1, sine of 90 degrees equals 1, that means 1 times momentum, the entire momentum. However, let's imagine we're forging wrong. Uh, let's imagine we're forging, pinching stuff out. Let's imagine we're uh, doing all kinds of these tappy taps. And uh, let's assume that the person using the hammer is still using a 6.6 uh, .6 pound hammer or a 3 kilogram hammer. But they're hitting at 45 degrees. Right? So now we change the angle, 45 degrees. In that case, because this becomes shorter, what we're doing is sine of alpha starts equaling square root of 2 over 2. And that means the actual momentum absorbed by your final piece is square root of 2 over 2 times 13.2 kilograms meter per second, right? So you immediately decrease the amount of efficient work that you're performing. It's actually worse. The reason is, I kept this as sine alpha. When you pinch, you let's say first start at 45 degrees. Once you make contact with your material, the angle changes, and then it changes until it goes to zero, right? Because your motion is somewhat in this direction when you pinch, right? At this point, this angle is zero. At this point, it's like 45, whatever. So it's not a full 45 degrees. It is an integral from, let's say, 0 to t, because it takes time for you to make contact, of p times sine alpha, sine alpha dt. Doesn't matter what time it is, even if it takes you 100 years to make the one pinch or a split second. It do, uh, let's not get bogged, down, <clears throat> get bogged down with these units. As, as alpha approaches zero, this, any unit of data here is approaching zero too because momentum times sine of zero equals zero. So as you're pinching, you're decreasing the efficiency of your distribution of force and momentum into your piece to the point of you perhaps are doing a disservice to yourself, almost negative work, right? Now, all this type of thinking applies only if you're imparting a type of motion that is responsible for changing the cross-section of your piece, right? However, let's see why that function is important as well. Surface of your anvil. Now, the cross section of my hammer is approximately three inches or five centimeters, right? Let's call it uh, A. And I have my knife right here. When I hit the entire momentum that we discussed earlier is received and canceled out by this contact surface here, right? That's not all. What happens is because if sum of forces equals zero at the end, sum of momentum equals zero, you can imagine that the anvil is a big hammer hitting on a small anvil down. The amount of force this way in the end is the same as down. However, just because in the end the kinetic energy of the hammer is 29 joules, 
that means that the, uh, that the energy going up is the same. So we have the distribution of 29 joules from the top on this area. But because we have this length here and the forces up have to be the same as the forces going down, these, the same 29 joules are hitting up here, 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 and here in places where the hammer is not contacting your material. What does that do to a hot blade? Well, it bows it out. That's exactly why when you're forging improperly on the long edge of the anvil, your stuff bows out. Because even though you're hitting down this way, the anvil is hitting down at this point, this point, this point, this point, this point, and this point. It's a little bit more complicated because we're dealing with the uh, square of the radius from the center and out, but let's keep it simple. That's why when you see me forging, I go try to use the shortest side of the anvil, especially for forging that I really care about and for final forging where I want the least amount of deformation and keep the blade straight. That's why I try to make sure that the edge of the anvil I'm using is approaching the width of the hammer. Now, why is that important? Let's go and check out the anvil real quick. If you look at my hammer, this is approximately, let's say, it's actually two inches in my case. I was wrong before because I didn't look at it, but it doesn't matter. Let's call it A, like whatever the cross section is, A. Now, we're also not looking at a two-dimensional surface. Let's just assume it's the length. This way, and let's assume it's the length. We're collapsing one of the dimensions. The kinetic energy of the hammer is distributed over the surface area of contact. In case of the hammer, the surface area is A, this. So, one-half M v squared over a right if a is one it's just one half mv squared if a is 1000 it's much less right now this the anvil surface is approximately one two three four five six so this side C equals to 6A, right? Correct. But that, let's calculate how much force these inactive side deliver up. Equals C equals 6A and the amount of energy is 29 joules. 29 divided by 6 equals 4.83. So every region is responsible for 4.83, uh, except this one. This one actually does some useful work, so we subtract it. And now we have only 5A that we care about. So 4.83 times 5 equals, equals 24.6. So when you're forging on a long side of the anvil, more force hits back on places you don't want to hit back up than in the place you really want it. And that's why you blaze more. If this sounds ridiculous to you, let's look at my anvil and consider what's going on. Okay, I'm hitting here. That is the motion with which everyone is familiar. Now, Turn your heads upside down and pretend that it's the anvil 
hitting the hammer. So this is, pretend like this is the hammer and this is the anvil. And it's easy to understand now why these corners will be drooping your piece this way. But the same exact thing is happening when you're forging normally. And that's why I have an old anvil and I didn't fix one part about my old anvil. The part I didn't fix is this little whoop right here. So, if I take my chalk this is lower than this flat surface which is conveniently very close to the cross section of my hammer. So I'm only forging here and allowing this empty space and this empty space to not eat up the energy of my forging. If you don't have such a convenient spot, what you should do is get a hardy tool like that, that is again close, and it doesn't let the surface of the anvil to eat up and warp your pieces. The reason why we did math today is because I find thinking like that incredibly useful in understanding what the hammer does and how it does it. It makes me more efficient. If you go further in the calculations, fix my uh, loose use of the terms and calculate how much actual work is done by a light hammer when you're crouching like that because instead of one meter you have 30 centimeters and then you're not hitting correctly you're hitting to the side so you're using the cosine and sine functions you will realize that one hit like that steady with my heavy hammer uh, normal to the surface intended probably has more value in terms of labor in it than one hour and crouching over the anvil and trying to pinch with a small hammer. So if you want to get better, practice this technique, keep honing your edge, and check out the previous beveling video here.